passage today is going to be Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words, and as people migrated from the east, they found the plains in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispensed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see what the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they, all, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there, from the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Next passage is Acts 2, verses 1 through 8. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in, one, in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Our next passage, Revelation 7, verses 9 through 12. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The next passage is Revelation 21, verses 22 through 27. And I saw another temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This morning, what I want you to see as we continue our series through preaching the image of God, this theme of the image of God, is that God is also, as he redeems individuals, he's also redeeming and restoring cultures, cultures and language. And we're going to look into what that means this morning. Now, there's a there's sort of a, if you know anything about the reformers back in the 16th century and the Puritans, uh, that kind of 17th, 18th century, and their approach to teaching and preaching, often what they would do is they would take one verse or one section of scripture, and they would just pound it into people. So uh, one common person, John Owen, is known for writing an entire treatise, a whole book, a volume, on one verse, and that is on uh, a verse in Ephesians that basically is just a benediction. It's the benediction, may the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And he wrote an entire book on that one verse talking about communion with God, how we can commune with the triune God. 
The Puritan approach, Richard Baxter, another Puritan, would often say that the Puritan approach to teaching Scripture was that they, it was like taking a screw, this is a little bit of a, a vivid imagery, but taking a screw and screwing every twist is an extra, you know, it goes a little bit deeper each time. So they would really want to pound this Scripture into your head. Martin Luther actually said, we need to pound the Word of God into people's head like a hammer. So, you know, we want to just keep that, that message and that truth going in and in and in. And so, in a way, this sermon series that we're preaching on the image of God is sort of like that approach to teaching. What we're doing, essentially, is we're preaching over ten weeks on Genesis 1, 26 to 31, which is that passage that we looked at specifically a couple weeks ago about God creating us in his image. And in that passage, he says things like, uh, have, have dominion over the earth, uh, cultivate it, govern it, and, and nurture it. And so, in a way, I'm kind of tricking you into a Puritan approach to preaching. And what I've done is I've essentially taken a six-hour sermon, and I've broken it up over ten weeks so that you don't have to sit through six hours of preaching. So, ha ha, I tricked you. Um, <laughs> But that's, that's essentially what we're doing this morning and, and over the next several weeks is we're just trying to preach this truth into your hearts that you are made in the image of God, which means you have dignity and purpose, but at the same time we've been broken by sin and he is restoring that image in us and in our world. And so this morning as we come to these several different passages, keep in mind that original statement of God that we were made in his image. And what does that mean? It means partly that we cultivate the world. That's what Genesis 1, 26 to 31 says. To subdue, uh, nurture, cultivate the world. And so that's really what we're looking at. Now when missionaries go on the mission field, before they go on the mission field, they often have what's called orientation. Orientation. They orient themselves to where they're planning on going. And so uh, this orientation deals primarily with two things, culture and language. So if a missionary, for example, was going to go to Brazil and they were leaving from the United States, they would go through sometimes two or three months or, or a year of cultural training, just learning about the culture by people who either have lived there or do live there, uh, from, from natives who are helping them learn the culture. They're learning the culture, learning the different habits that people have, the assumptions people have. They're learning the culture while at the same time going to language training. So they have to learn the language so that they can speak to the people. The whole purpose of that is mission. We want to be able to engage with the culture, to value the good things about that culture, but also speak the gospel where this culture needs to hear the truth of the gospel and hear about Jesus' grace. In order to do that, we have to be able to talk to them. We need to know their language. And so in a similar way, I went to Ireland in 2007. We had orientation. And, you know, Ireland, they speak English, but we were actually told several things about the Irish culture. I'm not going to break all those down here. Uh, that even though we're English-speaking countries, there are some phrases and words that you don't say in Ireland because that would be extremely offensive and sometimes profane. And then there's also habits that you do that you have to learn as an American is inappropriate in a place like Ireland. So all of those things... We're learning culture, and we're learning language for the ultimate purpose of making disciples by speaking the truth of the gospel in love. And that's really what I'm trying to speak to you this morning is, even though we live in this place of Batesburg, Leesville, uh, in the surrounding areas, and we might know the culture that we live in, and other times, you know, we, we might have a bias that, you know, this is just the way things are. This, you know, this is kind of the way things are supposed to be. But even that sometimes is just your cultural bias. And so what we want to see this morning is how does the gospel enable us as believers, as image bearers who are being restored back into the image of God, how does the gospel help us engage and know our culture 
goods and the bads, speak the truth of the gospel in love to our culture, using the language of our culture, ultimately to make disciples for God's glory. Are you with me? So that, that's, that's kind of the, the bulk of our sermon this morning. That's what we're trying to get this morning. I've broken that down into three things following the passages that Jordan just read for us. We're going to first look at what, how do we learn the culture, how do we know the culture, and then how do we speak the language, speak the truth of God with the language of the culture, and then ultimately because we're making disciples for God's glory. So those are the three things we're going to look at this morning. So um, if you have a Bible, if you want to follow along, the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at Genesis 11 for my first point, the Acts 2 passage for my second point, and then the Revelation passages for my third point. So if you want to go to Genesis 11, we're going to look at a few things there as we learn about engaging culture. And so what, what do we, when I say culture, what do I mean? Well, there are a couple different definitions of culture, but the first is that culture really means to take raw materials or raw data to work it, work with it, and to make something for the good of the people that are in that group. So that's all, you know, that goes back, actually. The word culture has a lot of ties in with cultivation. And you hear terms like agriculture, horticulture. That's because what you're doing is you're cultivating raw material in order to make something. Usually it's attributed to gardening or farming or growing something so that humans can flourish. They can eat, they can eat healthy, they can grow, they can be sustained. And so that, that's one aspect of culture. You're taking raw material and you're making something that's relevant or helpful or good for that group of people specifically. Okay, that's one aspect of culture. Another aspect of culture is um, coming from, from the Latin, the culture over time has, become to, has come to mean that it is the shared beliefs, values, vocabulary, habits, social practices, and assumptions of a given group of people. Let me say that again if you are trying to track here and, and take notes. It's the shared beliefs, values, vocabulary, <coughs> habits, social practices, that's how you relate to each other, and assumptions of a given group of people. So that's also what we mean by culture. You with me? And so when we talk about bringing the gospel specifically to Batesburg, Leesville, and our surrounding areas, and wherever you go from this place, what we want to understand is what are the beliefs and the values? What is the vocabulary? How do people speak? What are the habits and social practices and even assumptions of the people we are trying to reach? So that's important for us as a church to understand and know, but it's also important for you as you go to your workplace. And what we understand about every culture is that every culture is made up of image bearers, people who are made in the image of God, who are also sinners. Okay? So what that means is every culture, every group of people, Combined it with, with these similarities and shared values, and every culture has good traits about it and bad traits about it, even evil. Some, when you look at them, you might think, well, that one has more good than bad, and that one has more bad than good. But every culture, because it's comprised of a group of image bearers who are broken by sin, Every culture, when you get this group of people together, has good traits about it and evil traits about it. Now, this is where we come to Genesis 11 for a second. Now, what's going on in Genesis 11 is you've got this group of people. They have the same language. They're unified in this agenda, in this mission. And what is their mission? To bring glory to themselves. And so what do they do? They start building this big city so that they can stay together. And they start building a big tower. And what do they say? They say, let us 
build this great tower, let us make a name for ourselves. Now, what's the problem here? The problem is we were put on earth to cultivate the world for God's glory, not our own. And I, I bet you, if you were around at the time of Babel, you would look at this tower they built and think, wow, that is impressive. That's an impressive work of architecture and engineering and, and you know, whatever this tower looked like. And so even for Babel, you could probably, if you were there in that time, you could probably look at the Tower of Babel and say, wow, there are some good representations of the image of God here. His creative work. His wisdom and, and all these things. But obviously, this culture was polluted by sin because they had totally missed the point of why God had given the, them the ability to build and create and work. The purpose was to serve God, not themselves. So even in that culture, do you see what I'm saying? Even in that culture, there's good. But ultimately, the purpose in the, in the end was evil. And so what does God do? He confuses their languages. Why? In order to disperse them. And this is really what scholars, theologians, philosophers all say, uh, those who follow the scriptures, this is where that division and populating the earth originally took place. You got languages dispersed, so people go to all the different ends of the earth, start creating their own population there, and then what happens? They create their own cultures. You see where I'm going? All right, this, this is all hopefully going to tie back together. In my mind and on my notes it does. It depends on our time this morning, okay? But it, it's all going to tie back together. So the first thing we really want to see is that every culture represents good parts of the image of God, but also will have the markings of sin in there. Now, we also believe in a, in a doctrine called common grace. Now, we talk here about grace a lot. We believe we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's the only way someone will come to saving faith in Jesus is, is by trusting in him. And God gives us what we call grace or, in a theological term, special grace, saving grace, in order to believe in Jesus and be saved. But under that same umbrella of God's grace, which grace is just God's generous giving without us deserving it. So it's God giving us things that we do not deserve. So when he saves us by grace, obviously that's an act of grace because he's giving us something we don't deserve. Salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. But we also believe in what's called common grace. And common grace is that grace that God gives all people, whether they're saved, whether they're Christians and believers or not. He gives to all people because he is still a gracious and loving God. So sinners who do not believe in Christ, you can still see goodness in them, partly because the image of God remains in them, but also partly because of God's common grace on all people. Passages like, you know, it rains on the just and the unjust. Well, the only reason it rains on the just and the unjust is because of God's grace. None of us deserve rain. None of us deserve for our plants to grow and to be able to eat food because of sin. God's common grace enables us to do that. In the same way, God's common grace applies to when you see unbelievers who have really impressive talents, who do good things for other people, who are creative, who are wise, who are good thinkers. All of that is marks of God's common grace on all people. Are, are you tracking with me? I know this is a lot, right? We're getting into some philosophy this morning, which is kind of fun. We don't do this a whole lot. So common grace, God gives to all people. What this means, if we believe in common grace, if we believe in culture, this idea of culture, that every culture has good attributes and bad attributes, and if we believe in the image of God, which is in all people, though that image has been shattered and broken by sin, remember the broken mirror, if we believe in these things, which the scripture lays out, it means we can engage 
worked for 18 years, and he would regularly bring forward pro you know, proposals and all those things to end the transatlantic slave trade. And finally, after a long career in Parliament, he was able, through a little bit of wise trickery, a little scheming actually, if you go back and see this, it's actually pretty clever, he was able to end the transatlantic slave trade and, and really move towards the what would ultimately result in the civil rights. Martin Luther King Jr. would often reference William Wilberforce, and he would be a large factor in ending slave trade in the world. Now, William Wilberforce, this is the thing he is most known for, but while he was working on abolition for these 18 years in Parliament, just listen to some of these other things that he also did. He helped protect ethnic minorities. Specifically, he worked to have things written up to protect the Jews. He worked on prison reform. He worked on uh, improving living environments and sanitation. He worked for better pay for laborers. He even fought against animal cruelty, things like bear baiting and other forms of animal cruelty. He started a uh, an organization called the Lifeboat Institute because there were so many sailors that were drowning at sea. He put in protections and new training for them. Uh, he started schools for the poor and for the blind. He represented chimney sweeps because their job resulted in lung damage and sickness. He worked for mine workers, child labor factories. He helped in reforming the death penalty. He uh, worked against the, uh, he worked for humane justice systems. He helped even design prisons and disciplinary systems to, to better treat prisoners. He worked on something called the Reformation of Manners, which was generally trying to improve society and get rid of profanity, immorality, and youth destruction. All of these things are what we might call social reform. Social agendas. But William Wilberforce worked on all of these things because he believed in common grace. And he believed that there can be good represented in every culture and because he believed in the image of God that was in every man. And he did this as a believer in the gospel who also worked in his spare time, if he had any, as an evangelist, sharing the gospel with unbelievers. That's someone who was engaged in culture in order to come in with the gospel and help see the culture change for the good. And that's kind of what we're trying to get at is what would that look like for us to engage and appreciate certain aspects of culture and speak the truth in love to that culture. So uh, we're going to try to look at some specific applications in a little bit, but let's move on to our second passage and our second point. Speaking the truth in love in the language of the people. Acts 2 really breaks this down. At Pentecost, we see this scene where the Holy Spirit comes down and we see what's defined as tongues of fire. And they start speaking in tongues. Now, another way to translate that word, speaking in tongues, is speaking in languages. That's just another way to, to translate that. Now, there's been a lot of theological application in this, and I'm not trying to get into you know, different views on speaking in tongues. We can talk about that, but I just want to explain very simply in the text what this passage describes is that these, you know, for example, these were Galileans. They spoke in the language of the Galileans. The Holy Spirit lands on them, and they start speaking in other languages. It'd be like if I all of a sudden received the Holy Spirit, and I started speaking in Spanish, and Jason started speaking in German, and Rod started speaking in um, uh, Chinese, Mandarin, all right? That's what this is describing. This is not incoherent babble. It's just not. And we can talk about that in another setting. This is talking about specific languages that they started speaking. Why? So that people from these other nations could understand the gospel. That's what Acts 2 is talking about. Alright, we can talk theologically what is 1 Corinthians talking about and all that. That's what Acts 2 is talking about. Alright? 
Now, what are we saying? We're saying we want to speak the language of the people so that they too can hear the gospel. That's ultimately why the church is here, to spread the message of the gospel. And so what did the disciples do? They started speaking the language of the people. And this was a supernatural act because they didn't have language training. And what's going on in Pentecost is if you go back to Babel, what sin did at Babel was it dispersed people. It separated people. What's happening in Acts 2 at Pentecost is the gospel is bringing people back together. Unifying people from different nations, from different people groups. Why? Because in the gospel, we can be united in we can be reconciled, as 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 5 talks about, the ministry of reconciliation, bringing people from different nations, different cultures, different languages, and bringing us together under the umbrella of the gospel. Are you with me? And this is a really neat thing. This is a complete reversal of what happened at Babel. That's what's really, I think the Holy Spirit is trying to pound into us is, Something big is happening. Jesus has died, he has risen, and he has ascended, and he said, I will send the Holy Spirit to empower your witness in order to make disciples of all nations, and it's going to start here in Jerusalem, and it's going to spread to Judea, and to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And before that happens, I'm actually going to bring the ends of the earth to you. So that you can see a picture of that. That's ultimately what's really happening in Pentecost in Acts 2. It's a reversal and it's a picture. It's a vision of what God is doing throughout the rest of church history and into the future. That's why in Revelation what we're going to see is the final picture of the church is that all these people and tribes and tongues and nations are together worshiping God for his glory. Which is what? That's what we were first supposed to do. You see how this all comes together? It's pretty cool, isn't it? it? What we're doing right now, by the way, is called biblical theology. It's looking at the whole story of Scripture and seeing how it all fits together. And here's a little uh, plug. That's what we're doing tonight at Foundations. So if you want to come get more of this, come, come tonight at Foundations. We're going to be doing more biblical theology. And I think it's cool. All right, so that's where we are. All right, so we want to speak the truth of in love with the language of the people. Now, let me just talk, stop here and say, what does this look like in application? Okay, what does this look like in application before we get to our final point? Well, first is just think about Bible translation. Did you know for a thousand years there was only one translation of the Bible? Latin. It was called the Latin Vulgate. And Jerome, back in the um, 400s A.D., translated originally the, the Greek languages. He translated that into Latin because um, that was the common language of the people. And Vulgate actually comes from the root word vulgar, which we think about vulgar and we think that means you know, bad language. But vulgar just means common. It's the Latin term for common. So the Latin Vulgate was the translation of the Bible into the common language. But over time, tradition took over and said you can only read the Bible in Latin. And so the church actually took control, and they exercised power over people because people couldn't read the Bible in their own language. And they said you have to read it in Latin. That's the holy language. Now, a thousand years later, the Reformation comes in. Martin Luther, who was a German reformer, one of the things he did that totally divided the church and, and split the church and got the Catholic church really upset with him is he took the Bible and translated it into German. And this was a big deal. And he not only translated into high scholarly German, he translated it into common slang German. And in his translation of the Bible, he actually invented 400, I think it was 400, maybe it was only 40, but either way, uh, new words that were used in the language of the people, but were not actually um, put into an official language dictionary. So, I mean, 
you know, some words uh, in our dictionary that gets added, like all the, you know, BFF and stuff like that. That's now in the dictionary, I think. It'd be kind of like that. He's using the common language of the people to translate the Bible. And in the 1600s, yeah, in the 1600s, there was another translation that was done in the language of the people, the common people. And if the king at the time in England said, we need a Bible that all people can read, and we need to put it into the common tongue of the people so that they can understand it for themselves. You know what Bible that was? The King James Version of the Bible. And over years, what's happened is you've got an older translation of the Bible that then becomes the only one you're supposed to read. But the whole purpose of the King James Bible and of the Latin Vulgate and of Martin Luther's German Bible, the whole purpose was to get the Word of God into the language of the people so that they could read it and understand it for themselves. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And so, listen, we use the ESV here, right? There's a lot of different versions of the Bible. There are some that twist the meaning of the original text, so check with me. But there's a lot of good versions of the Bible out there that you can read to understand the Word of God. That's just one way... This has been applied throughout history. Now, what are some other ways we can apply language and speak the gospel into the language of the people? Now, I'm going to bring something up that's said a lot in our culture that I think we can take a hold of and speak the gospel to. And this, this might, I don't know if this is going to work or not, I'll be honest with you. Okay, but let me just put it out there. There's a phrase that goes around a lot right now. My body, my choice. Right? And most of you probably know what that applies to. My body, my choice. Now, if we wanted to engage in conversation with somebody who really believes my body, my choice, how would we bring the gospel into that situation? I think one way we could do that, over time, you know, you're not just going to be able to bring this in, but over time, be able to talk with that person and say, you know, Jesus had a body. And Jesus, before he went to the cross, he took bread, like we're going to look at today, and he said, this is my body. He said, my body is broken for you. See, what Jesus did at the cross is he said, you know what, my body is not for me. My body is for you. And I'm going to willingly sacrifice and inconvenience and, and give my body for the sake of another. And ultimately for the sake of others. And I think one way we could lovingly engage with a culture that believes everything is focused on what's good for me and my choices and my progress is to say, you know, this, this is not the way of Christ. And one thing is to speak the truth of love in them and say Jesus can forgive. No matter what your decisions have been in the past, Jesus can forgive and bring healing. But also, if this is really something you believe right now, we also believe that Jesus believes in sacrificing your life for the sake of another. He laid down his life. His body was broken for you. And ultimately, when we talk about that phrase being used, what that person is saying is, the life of this other one is not as important as my life and, and my purpose, what I think my purpose is. I am not willing to sacrifice my body and my plans for the sake of another. And that's really what Jesus did for us. He did sacrifice his body and he gave his life for us. So I think that's one way you can grab onto something that the culture is saying and say, all right, how, do, how can we apply the gospel to this? Maybe that's a little, maybe that's pushing it a little bit. But that's just one extreme example. There are, there are millions of ways you can grab onto the things of culture and say, you know what, I can use that to speak the truth of the gospel. So we want to use the language of the people to communicate the gospel to them. The final thing we see is what's the purpose of this? The purpose of this is to make disciples of all nations. Now Matthew 28, Jesus said this. Luke 24, he says this is the whole purpose of God. This is what God has been up to throughout history, is to make disciples of all the nations. 
And if we go back to Genesis 1, the first sermon on the image of God, what was his purpose? His purpose was to make more image bearers to fill the earth in order to represent his glory on the earth. Sin messed that plan up. And so part of making disciples is by sharing the gospel and seeing people come to saving faith, having the image of God restored in them, is going back to what our original purpose on earth was, was for. To glorify God in all the world, in all the earth. And so as we make disciples of all nations and of all cultures, that's the, the, that's the ultimate end, is God's glory. So Revelation, these two passages in Revelation, you've got the Revelation 7 passage, and you've got the Revelation 21. Revelation 7 is giving us a picture of what heaven is going to look like. This is what we're going to be doing in heaven. We're going to be worshiping God. And what does it say in verse 9? It says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation and from all, all tribes and peoples and languages. And one of those words specifically in there, the word for people, for all peoples, um, there's kind of different theories on how to translate that word. Another way you can translate that word is cultures. So we're talking about culture today, right? So another way you can read that is from every nation and tribe and culture and language. And so what we're saying is we want to engage lovingly with our culture, learn about our culture, identify the good things about our culture, and identify the bad things about our culture in order to speak the truth of God's love in the gospel in the language of the people to make disciples of our culture for the glory of God. Why? Because one day in heaven, that's what it's going to look like. And we've said here at Christ Community Church, this is part of our vision. This is what we want to be about. We want to be a church that is multicultural, that has people from different tribes and languages and cultures and, and nations represented here in our church as much as God allows us to do that. But what that means is we've got to be willing to lovingly engage other cultures. So let me just try to apply this a few in a few more ways specifically. Okay. Um, first, I want to just uh, answer the question, so what are some of the good things and what are some of the bad things about our culture that we live in? Okay, so let me just identify, and, and when I say that, I'm talking about specifically kind of small town southern cultures, right? So let me just identify some of the good things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out one specifically. Friendliness, all right? I would say overall, the southern culture is friendly, and what do we talk about? Southern hospitality, right? Friendliness. That is a good thing. I think, in a way, that reflects the image of God in people, that if you can actually look at someone and smile and wave and say hello or whatever, if you have never met them before in your life, represents that you can see something positive about that person in the image of God, and you're acknowledging that. So that is a good part of our culture. And I can speak to that because we lived in Florida for four years, and in Florida, people don't look at you. You walk into the door, they like purposely look the other way. I don't know what it is, but people don't look at you, people don't smile, people don't wave. Generally, some people do, but let me just say generally. So that's a good part of our culture, Southern hospitality, right? We praise that. But let me just identify something about, again, kind of Southern culture that I think has gone too far. And specifically when we talk about cultural idols, all right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something to see if I can kind of get a stir out of people. The United States of America will not be in heaven. Now, there will be people who have grown up in the USA, who have been saved as believers in the USA, who will be in heaven, and certain aspects of that culture will be represented in heaven. But USA has no parallel to heaven. And, you know, there's a song, there's a song that's been stuck in my head for the past three days. I really wish the Lord would take it out. But if heaven ain't a lot like Dixie, heaven's going to be nothing like Dixie. Okay? Nothing like Dixie. 
USA will not be. And, and so I'm speaking to a specific kind of uh, ideology in Southern culture that says, you know, you know, that whole America thing, right? All right. So I'm just saying, there, you can love your country, love the place you, God has put you, love the people that God has surrounded you with. But ultimately, if that is your idol, if you're trying to say we need to push this big America agenda over the kingdom of God, that is a problem. You created an idol out of your country and out of your culture. There are good things and there are bad things about our culture. You with me? All right, so that's kind of a specific application thing about. But then, let me just give you a list here, all right? And then we're going to pray and finish this up. What are all the things that culture obviously uh, uh, we usually think about when we think about culture? We think about things like clothes, vocabulary, food, you know, different culinary styles, design, even colors in design. Some, some cultures are more colorful, some are more kind of bland, pastel, whatever. Um, you've got different styles of music. You've got different types of art and all these things. So let me just speak another specific thing for our church that we're trying to do. We're trying to have what we call multicultural worship. So what that means is on a given Sunday, you might sing an old hymn with an old tune, and you might sing a really aggressive, energetic, loud gospel song. And you might sing an in in electric, driven, contemporary worship song. All of these things are cultural application of worshiping God. None of them are more or less biblical than another. Now, the words can be, okay? And so we also are very careful about the songs that we choose when we look at the lyrics. But cultural style of application is not more holy in one setting than another. <clears throat> now that can really shock some people, but that's what we're saying is every culture brings good aspects to it. And, and just to kind of pound this a little bit more, because I know I like hymns, I like older hymns, there are a lot of people in here like older hymns. Hymns come out of a very specific culture group. White, Western, European. That is a culture. Hymns are cultural. Are you with me? They're great. They've got great theology. I love them. And listen, this past week, like, uh, I think uh, five or six days ago, no, it was last Saturday, I think, sometime recently, last week, in the same day, I woke up singing a Latin version of a hymn, all right, that's off some movie called Henry V, and, like three hours later, was rapping a gospel rap song for my high school age, all right? And I love them both. And I'm a drummer. I mean, y'all know me. I'm a drummer, right? I like all kinds of different styles of worship and music and all that. And so what I'm saying is, in our church, we don't want to be stuck. Right? We don't want to be stuck. And we want to be careful of our own cultural bias. All of us. In order, why? To make disciples of all nations for the glory of God. Because that is ultimately what he's up to in all the world. And that's what heaven's going to look like. Amen? Amen. Alright, thanks for bearing with me. I got a lot more. Come, come talk to me afterwards. Alright, let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your love for the nations, for the cultures. Thank you that you are redeeming people for yourself out of every tribe and language and culture and people group. Help us as a church to make disciples of all nations for your glory, ultimately, not for our own. Pray this in Jesus' name.